folks, Freaky Friday is always a little bit unpredictable, but I feel like this might be the least predictable version of bold predictions of all time. None of that really makes any sense, but that's about the state of confusion that I have lived in for a week. Welcome to the podcast daily. It is Freaky Friday. It's Bold Peas with Bill Landis, Jeremy Birmingham, and me, Austin Ward. I don't know what's going to happen, so I don't know how we're going to make three predictions each about this game. Bill, what is? Uh, let's start with let's start with scores. How about that? Maybe that'll set the tone for what we're sure. going to talk about after that. Let's just lay it out on the table: who we think is going to win this game, and then we'll work from there. Bill, I don't know that I've heard a score prediction yet from you. Yeah, uh, so I'm picking Ohio State. Uh, I'm picking Ohio State to win twenty four to twenty. I think it is a low scoring defensive kind of uh, afternoon for for both teams. I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I'm anticipating either offense um, really breaking out and taking control of the game. I, I suppose if one were to do that, I would I would pick Ohio State's even in light of some of the offensive line issues, um, just because Ohio State's skill is significantly better than Penn State's, and I'll take Will Howard over a. Def- definitely over a banged up Drew Aller if that's who starts, and, and certainly over Bo Perbula if that's who ends up starting for for Penn State. So there's like a little James Franklin baked into the pick too, which I realize is not the most sophisticated way to pick a game, but um, I just like I like the matchups, and I think while I am concerned about the offensive line stuff, like we've we've seen about as bad as an offensive line performance as you can possibly see from Ohio state and Beaver stadium. And it's not like that game was a blowout. Like Penn state needed to win that game on a fluky special teams play at the end. So while I think Ohio state's offensive line will struggle at times, um, I, I don't know that it'll be to the point where it's not able to do anything at all on offense. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to pick the Buckeyes in a close one. Okay. Bill, as more of the analytic guy, the guy who watches a lot of film and football, like Jim Knowles has faced, and uh, Andy Koltenicki's offense before, right? One time, um, I think in Koltenicki's first year calling the plays for Kansas. And Kansas Kansas was not very good that year and uh, was also playing a backup quarterback, and Oklahoma State destroyed them in that game. Uh, so earlier in the week, I said uh, Penn State 24, Ohio State 17. As the week has gone along, as I thought might happen, you start to feel a little bit better about things. And especially if Ohio State gets Lathan Ransom back, I feel better than I would have, uh, you know, not being sure who was playing back there for Ohio State. I I am going to turn that and flip it a little bit and say Ohio State 23, Penn State 21 is my final score. I I don't know who's playing for Penn State. I think we're in this very bizarre uh, situation where Bull Perula may be a better option for Penn State, even if you even if both he and Drew Ella were healthy, because I think that Perbula brings something different to the table with his ability to run. Uh, and it's an area that Ohio State has struggled in with containing the quarterback. And while Aller is certainly not a statue, he is not a guy that really frightens you with his uh, athleticism. So um knowing that Drew, even if he does play, is not going to be 100% based on what we've heard out, out of, uh, you know, based on his knee injury. I think Ohio State has enough to get it done. I could see this being a 27 20 type of game, 24 20, 24 21, that, but I'm going to go with 23 uh, 21, something real close. Um, and uh, might involve a, a big day for Jaden Felding for Ohio State uh, because I just worry about the ability to get things done inside of the red zone for Ohio State offensively. Um, so that's where I'm going. 23, 21. After the angsty week that we've had on the podcast, it's, I didn't think we would all three be picking Ohio state to win, but that is going to be the situation because while I believe there are absolutely legitimate concerns about Ohio state that have to be addressed, there is no world where anyone who's watched the podcast before would expect me to pick James Franklin to win a game and I'm not going to start now. <laughs> but the three things that I might the, at the end of the day that is what it comes down to me. I always point to the three things, which is the quarterback battle, the coaching matchup and where the game is. Can't change the fact that it is in Happy Valley and I think it, there is some benefit for Ohio State that that game is at noon, but they've also won wideouts at night there. I don't think that that's something that 
the Buckeyes are intimidated by, can't overcome. Maybe playing on the road is actually a good thing for this team. What Whoever starts a quarterback for Penn State is not going to trump Will Howard, in my estimation. Talked about him with Berm uh, on Thursday and the way that he's been playing, the leadership, the motivation, everything that is pointing in the right direction for him. And for you know whatever questions have, a, have popped up about Ryan Day throughout his coaching career in the biggest of big games, he has met the moment against Penn State every single time. And James Franklin tends to shrink from them, most notably against Ohio State. So if that's one in the pro column for Penn State that I'm actually sort of trying to give to Ohio State, all three of those things point to an Ohio State win for, for me. I don't know that it's going to be a work of art, but I think I will take them to win this game 22 to 16. Mm. Yeah, so we're all we're all around similar scores. I was a little hesitant to pick a score for Ohio State that included a field goal because I I don't know I don't know if they'll kick any like if they're in a position that it's like on the border I think they'll probably just go for it um, and and that is I think largely based off not having a tremendous amount of confidence in their field goal kicking operation but I'm thinking maybe maybe the field goal I have in my prediction predict score prediction excuse me is like a on the fringe of the red zone kind of field goal, not a we're gonna a 30, a if 38 State, yarder. Yeah, if Ohio State like gets inside the 15, I don't think they're gonna be kicking any field goals. I don't care what the down and distance is. Okay. Well, that's that's a bold prediction in itself. It Way is. to fire it's it off. Cool. It's a pretty boring one, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah it is. Well, I don't know how exciting they're really gonna get based on the score predictions we have for this game. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, all right, I have a real one. A real that is not that is not one of my three. Whatever right. I just said about field goals. Um, my first whatever, goal, <laughs> whatever I just said about field whatever goals. I just said. Um, I think both of these teams will be led in rushing by a quarterback, um, and that Will Howard will score two rushing touchdowns in this game. I don't know. That's like a little straightforward with Ohio State. I just I think Will Howard's likes have to be a factor in this game, and, and I believe they will. And even if Drew Aller starts and gives it a go. They have played both quarterbacks all year, and I think Bo Perbula will probably play m- more in this game because Drew Aller, if he does play, I'd imagine his mobility will, will be limited. So I I think it could end up that Perbula ends up leading oh, Penn State in rushing, and that Will Howard will lead Ohio State in rushing. And I'm not talking anything crazy because I don't know I don't know that either of these teams are going to go nuts running the ball against either of these defenses. But and because the running backs, I think, might have a hard time. Um, on both sides, I could see the quarterbacks getting loose. So um, I won't I won't drill down on on specific yardage, but I will say that Will Howard will lead Ohio State in rushing, and Bo Perbula will lead Penn State in rushing, and that Will will score two touchdowns on the ground. Mm-hmm. I can dig it. I can dig it. You know what's funny? Um, as much consternation as there has been about the Ohio State defensive line and the lack of pressure, et cetera, and as much celebration as there is of what Abdul Carter and Penn State does, uh, Penn State only has 14 sacks on this season as a team, uh, which is one less per game than Ohio State, who has 21 or 20. Uh, Bill, as someone who is, A, a Penn State graduate and from Pennsylvania and somebody who watches a lot of football with Kings of the North, like, are Penn State fans clamoring for more like sacks and and more uh, production from their defensive front, or what is their reaction to that number? Because I hadn't really noticed it was that low until uh, earlier yeah. this week. Yeah, probably there were there were pretty high expectations for Abdul Carter. Um, he has four sacks this year, and so does JT Tuimolo. Yeah, and their pressure numbers, I think, like Penn State's edge rushers pressure wise are similar to what Ohio State has done this year. Um, and if you look at Penn State. Like overall pressure rate as a team, it's not bad, but last year it was the best in the country. And this year it's it's something somewhat significantly worse than that, even though it still is like top 25, I think. Um, so yeah, I think they're probably uh, the defense has played really well for Penn State. So I don't know that people are like totally screaming about what's happening, but I'm sure that that people were expecting them to get after quarterbacks more than they have so far this year. Um and my bold prediction is that Ohio State will have more sacks than Penn State. Uh, so, uh, you know, even with the offensive line issues for the Buckeyes, I, I firmly believe in Chip Kelly and Ryan Day's ability to scheme Ohio State out of sacks. I mean, it's funny because we, we've we heard the Ohio State coaches talk about how if a team doesn't want you to get sacks against them, then you don't get them. Um, and we've never really seen Ohio State be in the position where they're the ones that have to out-scheme or scheme out sacks. So I, I think Ohio State will end up this game with more sacks than Penn State. 
That's especially true if Drew Aller is playing, because if he's playing and if the knee is um, a sprain in the in the MCL or ACL or LCL or PCL or whatever PL it is, uh, um, CL, not PL, whatever, whatever, whatever L is going on. It's not a, not a medical show. Yeah, whatever the L problem is, um, I think that that is – I have a tough time believing Drew Aller won't try and play on Saturday. So I I think that um, at least early in the game, there's an opportunity for Ohio State to really get after him. Um, and I think – I am not. I don't know if I'm going to drill down on the, the players themselves other than the fact that I think Tyreek Williams is going to have two sacks for Ohio State. Um, and I think the Buckeyes will probably double up Penn State on the sacks in, the, in this game. Uh, one one thing there that because we were talking about offensive line for Ohio State earlier, and then to that point, Berm denied Dennis Sutton, who is Penn State's other Second best end, um, yeah. might not play. He was hurt against Wisconsin and then wasn't at practice on Wednesday. James Franklin said he's a game time decision too, but I, it was so weird. But both those injuries <laughs> to Aller and and uh, Sutton, like they're both on the sideline, both seem totally fine during the Wisconsin yeah. game, and I'm like I don't understand what's going on here, but. Um, Sutton yeah. tried to come back in and play. I think he played like one snap and then took yeah. himself out and didn't play again. So we'll see. Yeah, his looked worse to me than Al. Right? Like the nature of the injury when it happened, it was like, oh, he should be okay. But then he, it looked like he was really concerned about the groin, mm-hmm. and that's not something that who it, isn't. Yeah, you said it, buddy. Uh, that a defensive lineman would want to play through. I okay, like I said, unpredictable show. Good I don't know what transitioning to, from that. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that, but I oh, well, Gabe Powers, Gabe Powers. I so Burr made a point that I thought was going to be pretty relevant for this game, which is that Ohio State and Chip Kelly and Ryan Day and Justin Fry and Brian Hartline and Carlos Lachlan, Keenan Bailey can all scheme around sacks like other staffs can do it, then the Ohio State one can too. And I think that is where the creative offensive packages are going to have to be featured and i know that i talk a lot about pop passes and into rounds well guess what i'm gonna do it again a mecca ibuka has to be a prominent weapon in this game i think he needs to touch it 10 times i don't know if he will but i think that he's gonna have a rushing touchdown and i think jeremiah smith is gonna have a rushing touchdown in this game mm. i think that the that I, I like what Bill's talking about. I think if you get down in the red zone, like Will Howard's got to be a factor. <clears throat> Based on my score prediction, I don't. I'm not anticipating a ton of scoring opportunities for either team, and I think you're going to have to manufacture some of them. And we've seen that already with Jeremiah Smith uh, taking a touchdown on an end around for a score. I wanted to see more of a mecca in that package against Oregon. I thought that they were finding success, and they they that's one part of the game. One part of the rushing attack where I thought Ohio State could have continued to hammer that running straight ahead, as we talked about for the last six quarters, has not been a viable path forward for Ohio State. But they have athletes everywhere. And if you can get them in space, you don't have to block it up amazingly. does help if you do that, but I think you want to get it as simply as you can into the hands of your most explosive playmakers. And I think both of those guys can turn that in to touchdowns for Ohio State. So Emeka and Jeremiah Smith rushing touchdowns. I like it. I, yeah, I, I do think they're going to have to manufacture touches for, for guys like that. Um, I was thinking similarly for a for another bold P, and I wasn't. I'm not exactly still sure. He's was talking about it. Like how how to quantify? It. I, I just think Ohio State's going to throw a lot of screens in this game. Um, like the the last time Tom Allen, who's Penn State's defensive coordinator, by the way. Um, came into a game against an Ohio State team that he probably thought was a little vulnerable was that 2020 game where like Indiana was pretty good and they just blitzed the crap out of Ohio State and like was were really doing some exotic stuff with bringing safeties like from from depth and running them up the middle I I, just, I think he's really going to come after Ohio State's offense and make that offensive line prove that it can handle it and I think a way to counter that would be to kind of use the aggression against Penn State and throw some screens so and I think screens don't have to be merely running backs, right? We've seen the screens to Jeremiah Smith and, and Emeka Ibuka, and even some of those bubble passes, yeah, I guess you could qualify as screens too. Um, but I'm thinking more along the lines of stuff maybe to the running backs and the tight ends. Um, so I guess I'll say that Ohio State running backs and tight ends will combine for seven receptions in this game. Okay. Which, like, they, they've not, I think, Quinshawn and Travion have combined for 17 targets all year. Um, so it's not like those guys have really been a featured part of the offense. And the tight ends, 
especially now with Will Kaczmarek out, get the ball sporadically. But they activated G. Scott a little bit when they played against Oregon. I could I could see that happening here. Maybe it's a Bennett Christian or Jelani Thurman that gets involved, but I'm more thinking G and Quinchon and Travion are a little more involved in this passing attack. And uh, give me yeah, give me seven seven touches combined for the three of them via the pass game. Like that. Do you remember in 2020 that game against Indiana ended up being a 42 35 final? Ohio State was up 35 to seven in the third quarter. Mm-hmm. In that game. As as aggressive as Tom Allen was, as the the worst game in Justin Fields' career uh, at Ohio State, and the Buckeyes were up thirty five seven in the in the third. Uh, Didn't they run they, for like three hundred something yards in that game? Well, they stopped playing defense. Um, well, Buckeyes and Justin did. Fields lost his mind. He was trying. Like, he he was very he rattled. Interceptions. Very rattled by the pressure. He had not seen anything really like what Tom Allen dialed up in that game. Uh, yeah. but, it, but it's still a game. Ohio State had 607 yards of offense, 300 passing. Master T get 170 yards rushing. Uh, yeah, they they, ran, they rushed for 307 yards. <laughs> Their rushing totals in that game were 307 for Ohio State and negative one for Indiana. <laughs> so, it was the Michael was, Penix game, right? Yeah, <laughs> Michael Penix yeah. went cuckoo in the second half, just absolutely putting footballs in places that nobody had ever seen in Ohio Stadium until the next two years. When I've CD always said it. that Michael Michael Pinnix was a BPS. I've always said it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Ever, how can you deny it? Uh, Bill's a BP, not a BPS, but uh, his BP there was leading into directly what I was going to say because Bill, as always, takes, <laughs> takes my question. Um, <laughs> uh, Bill, I... Love where you're going. I was going to say that every receiving touchdown in this game, I don't know how many there are going to be. This is not my job to figure that out. Uh, every receiving touchdown in this What's game. What's the show called? <laughs> bold predictions, not oh, okay. firm figure stuff out. Oh. Uh, what day is every, that re- every receiving touchdown in this game on both sides is to a tight end. Um, that's my mm. prediction. Oh, wow. Um, uh, Penn State has thrown 16 touchdowns this season. Only five to their wide receivers, uh, so 11 of them to tight ends and running backs. Nicholas Singleton has four. Tyler Warren has four. Ohio State, obviously, is much more prone to using the wide receivers. But again, I, I keep I keep envisioning this game being a, a situation where the Buckeyes are in the red zone a lot. I don't know why. Um, and and I, I feel like there's an opportunity there for, for G. Scott, who I think will um, score at least one of those for Ohio State, maybe two, to, to be – the the guy in this game for the Buckeyes. That's pretty good. Um, So when we've spent the week talking about leadership and returning veterans and Ohio State program guys, uh, the first one that we always mention as a returner is like, well, the guy's got a blocko on his jersey. He seems to care an awful lot. And I thought he played one of his better games a week ago. I'm not sure how he's feeling physically after throwing his body around the way he did and leaving covered covered in ice against Nebraska. But Cody Simon is going to have to do that again and maybe to twice the level of productivity that he did against Nebraska. We know that Penn State's going to want to run the football. They're going to try and get the tight ends heavily involved. That's going to put Cody Simon uh, in the crosshairs a little bit. He's going to have to defend. Uh, both the run and the pass at the best level of his career, I think, for Ohio State to win this game or at least hold Penn State to the point total that I'm projecting. And I think he's ready for that moment. I think he's going to do everything he can to lead Ohio State. I think that's going to include 15 total tackles mm. uh, and two tackles for a loss. It's not going to be – I'd be surprised if it is an opportunity quite like he had a week ago to go blow up a bunch of plays behind the line of scrimmage and defend screens. I don't know that that's going to be the way that Penn State – Penn State shouldn't have watched what Nebraska did. I'm like, you know what? I'd love to do that. That seems like a great way to attack the Buckeyes. But they're not, you know, they have a great backfield combo with Katron Allen and Nick Singleton. If they are putting in Bo Prabula to run the football, like Cody Simon's going to be like in positions to make a ton of plays in this game. And I think he'll make them. I've got him for 15 tackles. Penn State does, uh, it's got a pretty high rushing play rate. It's like um, it's like fifty eight percent almost, which is top thirty in the country. So I do I do think they're going to run it a lot. It is time once again. Our future fan sports guest picker is back. We missed her so much last week, but Liberty is in the house. There she is, <laughs> embracing that future fans lifestyle. 
and future fans wants to send you and your child to the Ohio State Indiana game, a massive showdown in November. You gotta go to futurefans.com slash OSU. That's futurefans.com slash OSU. And you enter to win. It's got two tickets on the 40 yard line and on field experience to meet Brutus. He's pretty cool, right? Yep. You can be on with the cheer down on the field with the cheerleaders for the national anthem. Here's how you enter. Buy a future fans box. That's pretty fun, right? Yep. You can join the fan club. That'd be pretty fun. Yep. Or just post on social media and tag future fans who we all love. What has been your favorite part of future fans? Like? Well, the toys mostly, but <laughs> kids like me, they might they might love toys, but also besides that. You might just love the book and love playing the games with your family. Yeah, and you also learn football at the same time. A great, fun, interactive experience. A great way to make memories. You could make memories at Ohio State in Indiana, courtesy of Future Fans. That's futurefans.com slash OSU. But that game, that's for later in November. The first Saturday in November is for Ohio State at Penn State, and Liberty has two predictions. The first, someone who's definitely going to score a touchdown. Aneka Buka, he's Whoa. number two. <laughs> And, Jumping right into it. And um, why Emeka? Because, well, he seems like he's definitely going to. And you know, I've been picking Will Howard a bunch of times. Yeah. And also, another reason I'm picking Emeka is because I met him and it was really fun meeting him. Yeah. He is a wonderful guy and an awesome football player. He's a captain for the Buckeyes who play Penn State and the Nittany Lions. Except Center. for Will Howard. He's the actual leader. Well, he's a great leader. And he's I a know. quarterback. Great point. All right. So both of those guys are going to be really important. Are they going to lead Ohio State to a win? Buckeye? Yes. Okay. All right. That's an emphatic prediction from our future fans guest picker. She is Liberty. Now back to Bill Landis. I've picked two offensive bowl peas, and it would be it feel it would feel a little silly to do three in a game where, that I think is going to be pretty low scoring. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not 100% certain how Ohio State is going to defend Tyler Warren. But Doug and I were talking about this on Wednesday on Kings of Columbus, and I was reminded that the last time, I think the last time that Ohio State faced like a truly unique tight end was Darnell Washington in the Peach Bowl, and that's when mm -hmm. Sonny Styles was kind of deployed to cover him until Darnell Washington got hurt. And and Tyler Warren is not a is not physically the same player that Darnell Washington is, but he is a rather unique uh, matchup problem. So I I, I think Sonny will be following him around a lot. I, I, I see a lot of 4-3 in this game for Ohio State and Sonny playing that kind of Sam Nickel role, and, and maybe he just goes wherever Tyler Warren goes. Um, so I will say that Sonny, because Tyler Warren's going to get a lot of targets, I'll say Sonny finishes with eight tackles. I don't know how that would rank for him this season, but eight tackles and three pass breakups. And I don't, Ooh. and I think, and I think in the process, like, he does a good enough job of making sure that Tyler Warren is not the one who beats Ohio State. And I think I think that's probably the plan for everyone who faces Penn State is like anybody else but him. And force the ball, force Drew Aller to make plays with those receivers or Broker Bueller, whoever the quarterback is, because I just the receivers of that team don't scare me. Um and I don't think they should scare Ohio State even in light of some some secondary struggles the last couple of games. So really focus on Tyler Warren. Use your kind of likewise freakish athlete on the defensive side to, to shadow him. And I think Sonny can can hold up in that matchup. So um, Sonny, I think in that case, becomes maybe the most important guy in Ohio State's defense on Saturday. But I think he will rise to the occasion. I think he's played pretty well the last couple of weeks. So eight, what I say, eight tackles and three pass breakups for Sonny. I, again, was in a similar... I had a similar thought, uh, but it's Caleb Downs who's covering Tyler Warren this weekend, in my mind. Um, Could be, yeah. And and I that's partly because I don't think Ohio State, as you said, should be scared of Penn State in the vertical passing game, at least uh, to the point where you where you feel like you have to have Caleb Downs back there to to protect you from getting beat uh, over the top like you did against Oregon. Um, so I don't think you make that adjustment, you know, to try and counter what what Oregon did against Ohio State and because Penn State can't do it, I don't think. Um, but I think that this week is the first Caleb Downs interception of the season. Um, and I also think that he will have uh, three tackles for loss this weekend. So I, I think we're heading into uh, a part of the season where people, 
I, I do believe people understand how good Caleb Downs is, but I don't think it's really or necessarily translated to productivity or statistics yet. And this week, I think you get a chance to see both um, because he is a player who I, I think steps up in big games and in moments where um, people are watching. And uh, I, I just fully expect that Caleb Downs will be a, a game changer this weekend for the Buckeye defense. And so first interception of his uh, Ohio State career, three tackles for loss. And uh, again, I think he's going to be the guy following uh, Tyler Warren. But uh, Bill's plan makes sense to me also. But I, I think that Ohio State's going to need some combination of Sonny and Caleb to make sure because Nicholas Singleton out of the backfield is also a very big threat for Penn State. So it's really those two guys on the Penn State offense that beat you. If you and um, Ohio State will need their their best athletes to be covering those two guys. And so I think it's just a little um, mix and match for the Buckeyes there. I probably would have lost a lot of money betting that Caleb Downs did not have an interception in the first seven games for Ohio State. Like he's not doing anything wrong. It just hasn't come his way. Yeah, it's like I don't even he's not even really been close to one. He's doing a lot of run defending. Like he's not I don't even know how often he's been in coverage. He had a pass break up against Oregon that I can recall off the top of my head, but he's been a lot of fly down to the line of scrimmage like a madman and make sure these runs don't become touchdowns kind of stuff. So but he's been very safety good. driven defense, you know. It is. Yeah. You know, I said and joked that Penn State probably wouldn't be trying to duplicate Nebraska's offensive game plan from last week, but I've seen a lot more puzzling screen and draw decisions from James Franklin programs than I have Nebraska, to be honest. So I think that the long-awaited JT Tui Moloau encore will come in Happy Valley. I don't think it's going to be quite like the one two years ago, but I think he's probably going to intercept a screen pass in this game. I don't know. It's don't know what's going to go for a pick six. Don't. I'm not going to drill down too far on what it means, how it's, where it's going to wind up. I know that that's also shirking the responsibilities of bold predictions. But the the passion and energy that he showed in the second half against Nebraska, I think, has largely been missing, uh, based on what we've seen. I I can't talk about practice habits weight room, any of the other, like, I'm not there for that. What we've seen on Saturdays, I thought that, that JT has been pretty straight laced. And I know that the rest of the locker room loves JT. They all know what he can be at his absolute best, but you know, no matter if Nebraska was fooled on, you know, the, the blitz and, and JT had a free path at the quarterback to get the seconds, Nebraska, it doesn't matter. The way he responded afterwards is the kind of fire and urgency and intensity that I can't say we haven't seen it in two years since Penn State, but I don't know that we've seen it as frequently in terms of both production and uh, and energy as we finally did again on Saturday against Nebraska. Now, that was just one play, and maybe I'm going to read too much into it, but I feel like he can carry that over. And this game we all know is very important to Larry Johnson, and we know that the defensive line has felt challenged by everything that has gone on in the last couple of weeks. And... I feel like it would be a safer bet to wager on JT Tuimoloau meeting the moment than not. He holds like a like a mystique over the Penn State fan base and like media covering that team. I think <clears throat> they were asking a lot about him to James Franklin on Wednesday night, and it's fun. It's and I'm not saying like any criticisms that he gets from Ohio State fans or media are, are unwarranted because I, I I get there, there's a lot of truth in that. But the only thing Penn State fans know about JT is what he's done to them. <laughs> So yeah. like the way the way that he gets talked about in Penn State circles is actually quite funny juxtaposed to you know the the day to day stuff we do here. But I, I I think because of that like it's almost like it's it's in the mind of James Franklin. I think it's in the mind of their offensive lineman. There, I think there's a bit of a psychological thing there that perhaps JT can take advantage of. Well, which his is, two best games of his career are against Penn State. So yeah. it, it 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 there is at least some reason to have that boogeyman vibe about him. I guess, sure. but I think it's it, it is. We've talked a lot about Larry Johnson in the last year plus, but it is clear that his players like rise up for him when it matters. And this weekend does matter to him more than others. So, um, you know, we can, we, Austin, I talked about Thursday morning, the 2017 defensive line performance uh, against Penn State and the Joey Bosa, you know, pushing the backfield uh, in 2014. Like there's been moments in, in this rivalry where the defensive line has been the, the one that did the job for Ohio State. And I, the, a lot of that, I think, comes from them just defending 
Larry Johnson's honor at, at, against the Nittany Lions. Yep, they'll have that opportunity Saturday noon, Happy Valley. Looking forward. No, I'm not looking forward to the road trip. Well, I'm not going to lie. I'm looking forward to the game once it starts. Everything else, I can leave that. But uh, Berm and I are hitting the road later today, which is, of course, a freaky Friday to get ready for Ohio State at Penn State. We'll have road breaks later tonight. You will come hang out with us. It could be very interesting. I don't know. We'll be the another vibe check for Berm as we get even closer. Maybe he'll change his score prediction again. Who knows? Uh, we'll have pregame keys. 73 we'll have, to 6. <laughs> probably won't go that far. We'll, we'll have everything else from uh, Beaver Stadium on can Saturday. I, uh, yeah, you've got to. I, I was, I was going to tell oh, you what, buddy. Come on. I'm sorry. I, you're a pro. I apologize. <laughs> um, Doug and I, we're going to attempt. I don't, I don't know how well it's going to go, but we're going to attempt to do a live watch along for the Ohio State Penn State game. And then I also think the Oregon Michigan game um, on the KOTN YouTube channel. So. But well, you guys to, are going to be live for like seven hours. <laughs> yeah. He wanted to go live all day, like through the night games. I was like, I'm not doing that. But uh, K- KOTN <laughs> stands for Kings of the North for anyone out there wondering. Yes. Kings of the North YouTube channel. Uh, we will be live there sometime before noon on Saturday and then watching the game and reacting live to it. If you want to hang out while you're watching it yourself. Are you, are you having a soda like, or what? I mean, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Are you going to have like a Scott Hansen prep? Are you not going to have sodas? What are we going to do here? I don't know. I don't even know where. I, I, it might be in Doug's basement. It might be in his office that's a million degrees. So we may be flop sweating while we're watching the game too. So that, <laughs> that could be fun. Uh, there'll be, well, be beverages. Burns going to be sweating too. So don't worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. But uh, we're going to give it a shot and see how it goes. Hopefully it goes okay. So there are plenty of options be fun. for yeah. Ohio State and Penn State coverage throughout the weekend. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, welcome to November, which is for contenders. It's been a real treat to have Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham hanging out with me right here. Austin Ward, it has been the podcast. Freaky Friday, bold predictions. So long.